Since the dawn of time, there has been an age-old question that has plagued the existence of every single Dark Souls fan, and that is, what is the best Dark Souls 3 DLC? Well that is a question that myself and fellow video essayist Unajoy are here to answer once and for all. So the way this is going to work is it will be a two-part video, where we both debate the reasons as to why our DLC is the best one. Una will be covering the Ring City, and I will be, well you can see the title. The way we will be doing this is by talking about some agreed parts factors. These factors are the level design, the bosses, and of course a secret factor that you'll have to wait till the end of the video to find out what it is. So without further ado, let's put this eight year old debate to rest once and for all. So let's talk about it. level design of Ashes of Arendelle is what I call peak Dark Souls 3. I love everything about these areas, from the cyclical design all the way down to the aesthetic of them. After all, I am a self-proclaimed whore for winter aesthetics. And as I'm saying this, I have just realised I might be a tiny bit biased. It's fine, a bit of bias has never hurt anyone before, right? One of the things that I personally find quite interesting about the level design of Ashes of Arendelle is the vertical progression. What I mean by this is you don't necessarily progress through the level by going in a relatively straight line like you do in the other areas of Dark Souls 3, instead you venture up and down into the peaks and pits of the Painted World. As I previously mentioned, the Painted World has a bit of a cyclical structure. This is due to the fact that at the beginning of the DLC you end up at this cathedral on top of a hill, and by the end of the DLC you end up at this same cathedral but with an entirely new interpretation of it. The level design itself is actually quite a smart way of representing art. The true meaning of an art piece is put on display when you dive into the depths of it, and that's exactly what this DLC has you doing. And now you may be wondering, how does this make it any better than the Ring City DLC? And well, don't worry, we're coming back to that. But just before we do, I think it's about time that we speak about the best part of any Souls game, or well, DLC in this case, and that is of course, the bosses. Although there may not be a lot of bosses in the Ashes of Ariandel DLC, they definitely do make up for it for the amount of quality that's baked into these bosses. Although a tiny bit gimmicky and downright annoying at times, Grave Tender is still an incredible boss. Throughout the entire series, there's been two, maybe three different examples of different types of bosses being in the same arena at the same time, and Grave Tender is one of them. This fight consists of two phases, the first being when you go head to head with the champion's Grave Tender and he has a few extra wolves as just a bit of extra damage. Danger. And the second phase is when he calls in reinforcements in the form of a MASSIVE WOLF THAT IS SO GODDAMN ANNOYING! I cannot explain how many times this second phase has caused issues for me on the multiple playthroughs of this game I have done, but not only is this second stage despised by casual players, it's also incredibly hated amongst speedrunners, and it normally just begins to spam out the same attack which is the charge headbutt attack, when it definitely shouldn't. If you're able to handle the stress of the two enemies at the same time, then this fight's pretty trivial, it's still challenging but it's not really hard. But now it's time to talk about the main attraction of the DLC, and that is of course Sister Frida. Sister Frida is the answer to the question of what if we just took Maria from Bloodborne and smashed her into Dark Souls? Yeah, that sounded quite wrong. Frida is definitely one of the biggest skill tests of your mechanics while still being incredibly challenging as a boss. You will find it very hard to make space in this fight. This is simply due to the fact that the longer that the fight progresses, the slimmer the chance is that you're going to beat it. The reason for this being is Frida's kind of three bosses in one. Each phase of this fight introduces a new challenge. In phase one, it's just a simple 1v1 between you and Frida. In phase two, Father Ariandel's thrown into the mix, which brings back the stress and the struggle of dealing with two enemies at once, and if you haven't played any Dark Souls games before, that can be incredibly challenging. And of course, in phase three, it's another simple 1v1 between you and Frida, but this time she has a bit more of an advanced moveset, and her black flame can deal a lot of damage if you aren't paying enough attention or just not being careful enough. But coming back to what I previously said about the longer that this fight progresses, the slower the chance is that you're going to beat it, the reason for this actually being is because of Estes management. Estes management is an incredibly vital skill to have, and especially in this fight. Taking unnecessary damage and using up a charge for basically no reason will make it pretty impossible to beat her. Because just like every other two phase or three phase fight in this series, you have to beat her in one go. Yes, if you die, the entire fight gets 
it's reset back to phase one. Now this fight can be a massive pain, but it is incredibly rewarding. Because if you take the time to learn her movesets in each phase, you are heavily rewarded by the game. But also this fight has a little bit of a secret to it. And that being, if you can use your basic game knowledge or just any knowledge you have about the game and find Frida's weaknesses, this fight becomes a bit of a breeze. And in terms of bosses for Ashes of Ariandel, that's really it. Don't get me wrong, there are technically other bosses, but they are literally just mini bosses in the areas. And to be completely fair, some of these mini bosses can be genuinely quite challenging. For instance, Sir Wilhelm. This fight, even though it's just in the environment, it still gave me a lot of trouble and took multiple times to beat it. And then you have the Corvian Knights, which can actually give you a bit of trouble, but they are literally just enemies inside of the settlement area. Anyways, I think it's about time that we talk about that secret factor that I mentioned at the very beginning of this whole ramble. So let's do that. The biggest factor that makes me heavily believe that the Ashes of Ariandel DLC is better than the Ring City is of course the music. The OST for the Ashes DLC is one of the most emotionally powerful and just generally smart soundtracks I have ever heard in this entire series. From the very beginning of the DLC, there are hints that not everything is as it seems in the Painted World. This is due to the fact that the music has a very sinister feel that most of the music in the game doesn't have. Although somewhat smoothing, the OST has this undeniable edge to it that makes you feel like something's wrong with the Painted World. And this is something that only intensifies the further you get into the DLC. There really aren't any words to describe what the music made me feel during the Sister Frida fight. The first time I played this fight, the music genuinely sent a shiver down my spine. The music for the fight sounds so haunting, but yet so elegant. And then you have the second stage of the fight. The second phase of this fight gets really intense, but that is primarily because of the music. The massive shift in the tone and the pace of the music makes it feel like these characters are starting to get really desperate. And it's the same with the champion's grave tender. The music for the second phase of the fight takes the very similar tonal shift, but this time instead of being haunting, it's tragic. This is due to the fact that in the game's lore, the great wolf and the grave tender are just trying to protect the grave of a once fallen hero that they admired. Finishing this fight, I got a very similar feeling to what I did when I beat Sif in DS1. The game and the music do not make you feel good for beating these fights. And honestly, the music of Ashes of Arendelle could be its entire own video. But for now, let's move on to the moment that I'm sure you've all been waiting for. It's time for the comparison. Okay, so to start this off, let's compare the level design. The reason I feel that the level design of the Ring City is weaker than Ashes is just due to the fact that Ashes feels like it had a lot more thought put into it. And now, I know that a lot of people, yes I am looking at you Una, will say that the Ring City has a lot more areas than the Ashes of Ariandel. Which, okay, yes, fair enough, but also, can you honestly remember every single one of these areas? That is something major that you need to consider, simply because of the fact that quality does not equal quantity. What I mean by this is for the entirety of the Ring City, the story of the areas is put on display from the very beginning. Like, yeah, we get it, it's broken, it's damaged, maybe let's just consider taking Ash's approach to this level design. The painted world only really starts to twist into what it really should be perceived as the later you get through the story. That feels like it's a lot smoother of a transition and it doesn't get beaten over the head by the second area. But now I hear you wondering, well, what about the bosses? Now, I know that the Ring City has a lot of bosses and Ashes of Arendelle only has two, but I have to reiterate that quality does not equal quantity. A lot of the fights in the Ring City DLC feel like they were built to be gimmicks. For instance, half Light. Seriously, that fight was about as memorable as Walnir. Sure, on the first playthrough it's fun and exciting and it's cool, but on repeat playthroughs it's just like, wait, do I really have to do this again? Like, let's be honest here, does that fight really need to be here? But now, I feel like it's time that we talk about the main attraction of the DLCs, and that is Slave Knight Gale and Sister Frida. Now, when comparing these two bosses, it's actually pretty difficult for me. 
happening. As of recording this, I still haven't scripted that section because I genuinely could not put it into words and I just thought it would be better to improv it. But to be completely honest, out of the two of them, I do genuinely feel like Frida is the stronger contender. Now this is where personal preference comes in, because personally, I know how I like my bosses in this game, and it's very similar to Bloodborne, hence why I'm choosing Frida as the stronger option of the two. But that's not to say that Slave Knight Gale isn't a really cool boss who was very well thought out and is incredible to play against. He is probably one of the best bosses in the franchise, and his arena is so cool, but just because of how I personally like the bosses, I have to say that Frida wins this on every single merit. And now you may be wondering, well, why haven't you spoken about the special factor yet? And well, actually, that was pretty intentional, because if you want to be able to compare the two special factors, then I guess you're just going to have to watch Una's video. It's only through watching Una's video that you will finally be able to answer the question of which Dark Souls 3 DLC is truly the best. And until that point, this debate remains open. So feel free to talk about it in the comments section, because I'm actually pretty interested to hear your guys' thoughts on this. But for now, that's all from me. Thank you for watching.